Hey, 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 good evening, Kings fans, and welcome to News Across the Kingdom. I'm your host, as always, Edgar Zuniga, aka the original Bailey. And I'm joined, as always, by the Salvi King, Bryant, blah, blah, lovers. Your What's Highness up, is here. Your Highness is here. <laughs> what happened to your crown, bud? Um, I was misplaced by this hat. It's getting polished as of right now. Yeah, so it's not true that you got attacked by some Islander fans at that last game? <laughs> it is not true. <laughs> all right. Well, the LA Kings are in St. Louis tonight, and we have a special guest all the way from the Lou. It's Matt Big Bird Baker. What's up, Matt? <laughs> oh, thanks for having me, as always, to talk a little hockey. Always, always good to break it down to the puck. Hell yeah, we're moving the puck around the rink right now. And the Kings are once again trying really hard to miss the playoffs. Good God almighty, Jordan <laughs> Bennington of the St. Louis Blues has a shutout going right now. Dear God. Ah. Anyway, it seems to me that the Kings are allergic to maintaining control of the puck or winning uh, puck battles tonight. And I, I seriously feel, Matt, that if the Blues are going to hold Andre Kopitar anymore, they're going to need to buy him a drink. Mom, what's going on with that? And hey, got to do what you got to do. The Blues, they, they're they used to losing streaks. Why not build up a winning streak, trying to carry them into the playoffs and limp along so we could do a, a serviceable, mediocre job like we always do? Well, the Kings, you know, got a little glimmer of hope with that win over the Islanders over the weekend. But right now, it feels like the Blues are all over the Kings. They have more shots on goals than the Kings did in just their first power play, which is kind of sad. And look at this. I'm looking at the game right now. World-class skaters are falling down like toddlers at the public free skate. It's pretty sad. Uh, what else can we expect tonight from the Blues, Matt? Uh, I think uh, Bennington's going to carry that shutout in. You can look for uh, maybe a, a brace from Jake Neighbors. Torpchenko might might score another one. I think I think things are looking pretty good for the Blues there at home. Get a, get a back-to-back win going on. Well, hopefully, uh, Quinton Byfield can get his uh, you know get to get things together tonight because the Kings really need to maintain some kind of momentum. What do you think, Bryant? I approve. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for entertaining us. <laughs> Actually, welcome to News Across the Galaxy. <laughs> Brian, take it away. Where we talk all things LA Galaxy. And of course, <laughs> I have my two guests here. My one co-host, Edgar Zuniga, and our guest, yep. uh, Matt Baker. How you guys doing? Big Bird Baker. <laughs> Big Bird Baker. Yeah, that was something. I, I love it. I, I'm still happy to be here despite that nickname. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, speaking of that game in the Avengers, I was there. Um, it was maybe my third hockey game, and it was with the Kings, and I got to see the uh, the Islanders get destroyed by the LA Kings. I didn't know the Kings were that bad, or they were trying to fight playoffs, but I got to see a win, and I got to see three goals and a shutout, so that was pretty cool. Yeah, just to wrap things up with the Kings, um, it it, it, it kind of ties into the whole AEG thing, because uh, Galaxy and the Kings are all, both owned by AEG. Uh, I used to always say how great it was to see the LA Kings uh, go from being a mediocre team after the Stanley Cup years to putting together the right people in the front office so they could rebuild the team that was full of uh, young up-and-coming talent, uh, proven veterans around the, around the league. The Kings always do well in the, before the trade window, um, at least in the Stanley Cup years they did. And I felt like things were going in the right direction. A lot of fans did. At the end of the 2023, the Kings were a really good spot. They were one of the top-ranked teams in the league. And then I don't know what the hell happened. They only won three games in January. And from there, it was just like a, they fell off a cliff. And a lot of people want uh, the GM, Rob Blake, out of office. People are pointing fingers everywhere. The Kings, meanwhile, are trying to figure things out. During this time, they fired their coach. It's a mess in the kingdom. Uh, so going back to the other Galaxy, uh, it feels like the roles have been reversed because the Galaxy went from like having issues in the front office to all of a sudden, they put together a pretty decent team um, after just the first two games a lot of Kings fans I mean Galaxy fans were like really excited they're like oh my god you know we're back we're back and I was like Shh, no not yet not yet you know it's gonna take a long time for uh, the Galaxy's back but at least 
from the first two, three matches, it's a lot better than they were a year ago because a year ago they still hadn't won the game and things were gonna go were gonna get a lot darker before they were gonna get better. Um maybe to put things into perspective, uh Matt, how did you view the 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 galaxy after three matches from your point of view? A lot stronger than what I remember seeing last year, and a lot stronger than I remember looking at when when we had our our discussions and when the the I almost said the Blues were going to play, but when City <laughs> going to play Galaxy, and and just the expectations going into it, right? So St. Louis is coming off a, a pretty decent stretch of games where we're also un, unbeaten, and I feel like the Galaxy are the strongest team that we will have faced so far, having played. Uh, Real Salt Lake, New York City, and Austin, I think it's easy to say R- Real Salt Lake's a good team, but Galaxy is the team that gives me concern. And your style is working for you I, from the games that I've watched. I mean, Joseph Paintsill, holy cow, that guy can make the ball move down those wings. And Ricky Pooj is doing Ricky Pooj things. He's making everything happen. I was looking at his numbers, trying to compare him to our Edu Leuven. And that guy, I, I don't know if he can't just, he's addicted to touching the ball. He, our, your offense just goes so well through him. And Jovalich is such a good finisher this year. And it, uh, PKs aside, but <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I've, I've been impressed with just how effective that they've been doing the things that you expected them to do in that style of play. No, it definitely is. It's, a, it's quite a change uh, for us because uh, for so long, Ellie Galaxy was trying to find some way to get a proven goal scorer or generate any goals and uh, just to make something happen up front. And all of a sudden, you know, they're giving these wonderful tools and Joseph Paintsill, who we saw, we got dividends from almost immediately. And then you have Gabriel Beck in the wings. A lot of people are wondering where he was this weekend. Hey, he got hitched. Congratulations to him. Once again, yeah, congratulations, congratulations to him and his beautiful bride. Uh, hopefully he's back he's in the be lineup. Honeymoon though. He's going to be on his honeymoon, though, right? He's not going to play against St. Louis, is he? Oh, the honeymoon's in St. Louis. Ah, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so if you see him, you know, like, you know, going down the street with his, you know, his beautiful bride, you know, make sure to, you know, toss some rice out his way or something or whatever <laughs> St. Louisans do. St. Luligans do, right? St. Luligans. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we see him back in the lineup. <laughs> I mean, if, he, if he's not, I don't blame him. <laughs> but, um, yeah, there's a lot of exciting things happening. Uh, there's still some people that we're missing, like uh, Jalen Neal's not there, for example, and some of the players that were injured last season, uh, they're getting more minutes, but they're still not up to the fitness level that we were accustomed to when, when they got injured. So a lot of exciting things going on over here. I'm still not sold on the team being back, and the reason I'll say that, and Eddie and I were talking about that on Sunday, is that I feel that... Every match uh, Galaxy has played this season so far has been against a team that has been compromised for some reason or other. Like, for example, the game against Miami. Miami had, what, three, four days rest after playing RSL, who almost gave them a heart attack. And um, Inter Miami was doing this, knowing in mind that they had to play, you know, they were were playing the CONCACAF Champions Cup. So they're trying real hard to make sure that their guys aren't too weary because, you know, they're older players and they want to make sure that they're fresh. But at the same time, they have a certain standard that they need to keep up with. Galaxy should have beat them. They should have beat them. Uh, There was a missed penalty in that game. Really bad officiating that led to a red card that should have never been, which was actually rescinded in retrospect. Um, And that felt like that changed things for uh, for us. Um, But nevertheless, it was still a 1-1 draw. And then uh, the match against San Jose. San Jose... Uh, we always expect them to be a worthy opponent, and they're not that good this season, I want to say. I mean, Galaxy players were talking about killing them, you know, in the second half, letting you know, like, you know, what how they saw uh, the Smurfs. And then, uh, this last match against Nashville, Nashville obviously did not have their, their A squad out there, Zimmerman was out, so. For me to sit back here and say, yeah, we're definitely back and I'm really excited about this team. Yeah, I'm excited about how they look and how they're playing, but I'm also not going to ignore the fact that they still haven't played a team at full strength. So I'm looking to this next match against City as an opportunity for Galaxy to play against a team that I feel is like in a much better situation than some of the other teams we've played so far. Would you corroborate that? 
Yeah, I mean, I th I think that St. Louis, after bouncing out of CONCACAF Champions Cup, is trying to find health, and they found it in their top players. The injuries that we have in St. Louis are our backups and and the depth that we have. So we're, we're our, two of our center backs are injured, but our top two center backs are healthy. Joachim Nielsen, Tim Parker. We have uh, a phenomenal right back who's entered the league, Thomas Totland, and he's just opened up so many options for our team. He's, he's acclimated really well to the squad. He plays off of other players extremely well in being able to progress the ball. And all of our attackers are healthy and our, our midfielders are in form, but we have yet to really, if there was one area that we have yet to see kind of everything gel for at least a couple games in a row. It's our forward position, our strikers, Sam Adenarin and Jacques Klaus. Klaus hasn't yet really hit his stride. He hasn't hit his goal scoring form, but he's looked good off the ball. He's looked good in what he's been asked to do. Sam Adenarin had had a, a good uh, first game. He had a great shot in the second game and he was absent, completely disappeared in the third game. The, uh, the Austin defense completely shut him down with their low block. And so, when you're when you're having certain players like that being completely taken out of the game, it makes generating a lot of those finishes difficult. And you're you're providing trying to provide opportunities for your forwards, and it's not happening. That's where I think St. Louis has been struggling as of late. Where St. Louis hasn't been struggling as of late has been progressing the ball for so many games in 2023. The big knock on St. Louis is that they were Red Bull light, or they were a version of energy energy drink soccer. They would just send the ball. And they would just try to be as direct, as few as few passes as possible. And they would just try to make things happen in 50-50s. This year, though, we're seeing a little bit of a hint that what they had talked about in preseason, this other ability to possess the ball when needed to, to beat down low blocks by working in the small spaces. We've seen a couple of that, a couple of times where that's been highly successful, especially against Austin, where we had like 57% possession, which is unheard of for a St. Louis team to do and be successful. We did that last year, but we were blown out of the water every single time we did. So that's kind of my where we're coming into here from St. Louis is there's multiple ways this team is trying to figure out how to be successful. But I see a matchup against the Galaxy as really beneficial for their bread and butter, their counter, their counterattacking, their pressing, their ability to be really direct with the ball against a team that from all accounts on my end, you guys like to possess a lot. Yeah, definitely. Um, Bryant, uh, what do you expect from the Galaxy in this match against St. Louis? Do you think that we're going to see more from Gabriel Beck? Or do you think that he's going to keep coming off the bench? you think Fanny's going to change the roster at all? So this is, a, you touched up on it earlier, um, Matt, that having a Joseph Peso makes us seem look different. Uh, in years prior, the Vanny system wasn't working because he didn't have the exact pieces that he has now in Gabriel Penso. Now, we've seen Peck for maybe one half, and that's as much as we've been able to see, but the one that's been filling in the shoes and making the wheels turn on the offensive side has also been a Diego Fagundes, who has slipped in into that other side of the wing, is, and he's been more than serviceable. Um, it's been already, what, these three last matches with the same lineup, and somehow the wheels have been turning with this team. Um, playing against the St. Louis, so I got to see the full match against Austin, uh, Lovin, what a center mid. This man is, <laughs> I could say he's one of the top five center mids in MLS. Uh, everything that goes through his feet, he's so calm, collective, and he puts everybody in to the right position to, to be successful in the attack. One of my biggest fears of having the current center backs that we have right now with uh, Martin Casares and Maya Yoshida is was the H factor. Um I was hoping that they'd be tested earlier against a young team in San Jose where a speed, a speedy forward could be a factor against those aging center backs. And I think against a St. Louis team, we might get to see that a little bit more, especially now that you could have a Klaus um, who could pretty much put a body on, on the two center backs and, and have other players play off of him. Um, it's going to be a real test, uh, especially for our center backs. I, uh, the age combination is like maybe 2000 years old and, and combined, <laughs> but, and, and seeing some young fast forwards is going to, you know, I want to see that. And I think St. Louis is going to be able to, to provide that for us. See a better sample of where we're at uh, in general in MLS. 
On the St. Louis side, one thing that I think to that point is we have not been playing Klaus and Sam and Denneran together. The past couple of games, it's been more like a 4-2-3-1 or you're using AZL Jackson, who's the speedster that you're describing as a second striker, as the number 10 underneath. And when I, when I listen to you describe kind of how Klaus can be effective in bodying some of those center backs, I think of AZ speed. AZ Jackson isn't a goal scorer by pedigree, but he's a chance creator. He's a disruptor in the final third, and he he's fast, he's good in tight spaces, and he's he's really good in kind of seeing open areas. And so it depends on if he can find spaces that Klaus can open up for him, which could cause a problem, I think, for those center backs you described, right? Yeah, it'll be uh, some home cooking for the LA Galaxy because they're going to be back home. Uh, one of the things that I pointed out over the weekend uh, was how I was looking at how Pinto was reacting to his first real trip outside of California because so far every game uh, that the Galaxy had played up until that point was, you know, here in California. Even the the preseason games uh, out in, uh, you know, uh, Coachella Valley. So I don't know if it was the spring forward, uh, losing an hour of sleep, having to get up that early. Uh, but Pinto was not himself. He wasn't as speedy. He wasn't as sharp. Uh, and when uh, Eddie and I did the you know the review of the match, we actually gave him the the Gio Award, which is in honor of Gio uh, Gio um, Dos Santos. Dos Santos. But it's called yeah. also the, the Game is Off Award. <laughs> and uh, we said you know his game was definitely off. I mean that's the description of the of, of the award, and it just didn't seem like he he was all there. So. You mentioned before we came on, you know, it, it's rough to, for everybody, all of us here in the U.S., right, to lose one, that one hour of sleep uh, when we spring forward. But having to get up early on a Sunday morning when, you know, usually maybe these guys are in bed on a Sunday morning and then, what, you're up at 1030 in the morning, which is actually, what, 930 a.m.? That's kind of rough, right? I mean, you guys are fine, but our you know, our like sleepy West Coast guys are like, what? What's going on? Still getting that crust out of their eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, it's in LA, so that means that you know, St. Louis guys will definitely you know get tired earlier, right? I hope. <laughs> not used to being up late. We're not used to being up late. At least this year. Nah, it's it's nappy time. <laughs> um. But uh, this is a match that, like I said, we're really looking forward to because both teams are at the top of the Western Conference, well, near the top of the Western Conference, uh, and points matter so much, whether it's the beginning or at the end. A lot of people are saying, ah, it's okay, you know, if they start off slow, they're going to get better as, as the season progresses. And then when you get to the season and you're missing the playoffs by one point, ah, oh, damn it, you know, maybe you should have won that game, you know, in week four. Um, but... Uh, this is a game, I think this game is going to determine a lot as far as how teams are going to jockey at the beginning of the season. It's going to answer some questions for us regarding, uh, like I said, how Gax is going to match up against a team that you know that I feel is legitimately strong. But also, uh, Matt, I'm asking you this because we saw Austin fall apart in their sophomore season. How is St. Louis going to try to avoid the sophomore jinx? Well, like I said, they're trying to find new ways to play against teams that figured them out and actually learning from what ended up happening at the back half of 2023, which is a pretty mediocre run after league's cup. And it was by and large because teams started to drop back. St teams were trying to make St. Louis possess the ball and having that extra dimension is going to do so much, but also St. Louis sticking with their core has done a lot. So they brought back 19 players from last season. And when you're a first year club being run by a first year manager, with a lot of first-year MLS players who are coming in up from abroad, there's so many unknowns that it, it really was shocking how well they started off last year. And I think that's a credit to our sporting director, Lutz Fennenstiel. It's a credit to our head coach, Bradley Carnell, and how quickly they were able to get everybody together. We talked before about the 2022 season, bringing in a bunch of guys, getting them acclimated. So they've been intentional with building this up, and now they're intentional about keeping it together. And so that's a big benefit is these guys know how to play with each other, and you add some key pieces on top of that without losing really anybody who contributed last year. You're able to take everything that they learned from the back half of last year and, and grow it as opposed to starting from scratch, going back to the drawing board in a lot of different ways. And so I think they've made the most of these opportunities. And from all accounts, all they have to do is 
perform to their XG and they'll be pretty good because they underperform their XG for the, one of the first times in history against Austin. They're, they're getting chances in and around goal. It's just, they're not falling in mass yet. And so you have one win, two draws. That's the thing that I think they can carry forward, especially like you guys are saying, St. Louis is a good test for you. I think this is a good measuring stick for both teams where galaxy have these expectations coming into this year. St. Louis has expectations to regress, but still to make the playoffs. You know, we're not a team anymore that's catching people by surprise. We're a team where people are expecting us to finish fifth through eighth, which is still pretty decent, pretty respectable. You're getting more wins than you get losses. And I think that's that's a pretty good expectation to set for this team. And I would call that um, far from a sophomore slump. I would say that's a pretty successful second season if we can get into the playoffs in that way while still finding this extra dimension to our team. Okay. Um I know that <clears throat> over the weekend, both teams had uh, had to come back. Uh, I know the LA Galaxy was down to nothing. And for uh, for what we had come to expect, for a lot of people, it was a huge shock. A lot of people were already going full chicken little or like, dear God, this is, it was all a mirage. It was all a mess. And, <laughs> you know, and then they came back and everybody's like, yeah, it was all good, baby. It was all in the script. Why well, you uh, got to expose me like that, though? <laughs> Don't expose I me mean, like that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I over on Sunday, I, I, I bemoaned these lost opportunities, which really grind my gears. One hundred percent. They, they could have won against Miami. Yeah, yep. you know, they could have won this game against Nashville if they it, at least they would have at least taken the, you know, the lead uh, early on. Which I said, I told Eddie, uh, if they wanted to, if they really wanted to dominate that match, they needed to do it early, score early and put your foot on their head because you know in the second half Nashville is going to put in all their guys and they're going to try to steal the game back and uh luckily Galaxy was able to come back um they took advantage of you know some um you know the fact that Zimmerman wasn't there um Nashville probably has their minds on the match that they're playing right now actually as we speak against Miami mm -hmm. which at the last time I checked it didn't look like things were going uh, well for them uh, man, that Inter Miami machine. Oof, goodness. Anyway, I digress. What I'm trying to say more than anything is that Galaxy was able to mount a comeback. You know, and they should have won the game. Uh, towards the end of the game, also Dejan Jovalich had a he missed a sitter. Uh, he had an opportunity to put Galaxy ahead. He, he didn't get. You know, he didn't score. So, as much as he has scored so far in every game. He has also missed some really good opportunities. And I hope, I really sincerely hope that this is just him getting some of that early season rust off. And that by the by April, by May, he's gonna be in a better headspace, in a better um I don't know, uh what do you want to say, just in a better situation as far as being able to not even overthink these and just put them in. But it's weird. Uh, how do we describe his his mental state? Because obviously he's not the same day on from 2022. Uh, and it feels like he's been humbled a bit. You look at his, his goal reactions, they're kind of muted. He doesn't do the pistolero, uh, you know, goal celebrations that he was doing for a while. And so you wonder, like, what's going on in his mind? You know, because he missed a penalty. Then he scores a goal. Then he misses another one. And you're like... <laughs> but this, doing, is what, this is why I'm gonna give you a little pushback on that because this man has three or four tallies, uh, assists and goals in these three games. And for a player that we have criticized on this show a lot about him not being able to create anything or score, he's doing more than all right for the beginning of the season, especially after letting go a prolific scorer in Chicharito. Uh, we and need Billy Sharp and Billy, and Billy Sharp, and so. I think with this upcoming match against a St. Louis that they haven't been bad defensively. Uh, the only two goals that were scored was against uh, Austin. Am I correct in saying that? And so there's going to be a, a tough task for Jovalich, Paintsill, and Peck to, to go in there and score. And seeing that Dayon does have these goals scored in these last games, uh, I wouldn't put it past him to put another one behind uh, St. Louis this weekend. 
Wow. So you need to stop uh, on the Jovalich stock because that's my guy now. Hey, I'm the Jovalich stand, dude. I'm the one who's always saying, "Come on, Dan, you know, stunt on these hoes." <laughs> but um, like we, like I said earlier, uh, both uh, our clubs had to come back. Uh, Matt, can you describe to us what happened in Austin? Why why was St. Louis down early, and how were they able to get back into the match? Mental lapses on set pieces. That's that's really what it was. St. Louis actually dominated the run of play fairly well, not just in possession, but in just the momentum, the shots. Austin only had two shots on goal, and they were their two goals. St. Louis has done really well in their first three matches of limiting shots on goal. Austin had two, New York City had one, and then Real Salt Lake had three. It's been fairly well defensively inside that 18-yard box. But against Austin, it was a corner kick that we just didn't – didn't have the goal covered. The, the guys were marked and everything. It was Matt Hedges who did it, the defender center back. And he just rose up over our midfielder, Chris Durkin, and put it right in between Edu Leuven and Roman Berkey. Just a lapse in positioning. And then the other set piece of sorts was a throw in that it was, this is, this is kind of a typical St. Louis uh, deficiency is we collapse onto the ball inside the 18 yard box so much. And on this throw in, it was a throw in that reached the box. The ball ended up on the opposite side from the throw in. And you have like seven or eight St. Louis city players who start to turn and collapse on the ball. And then you have Julio Cascante who just, he, he was the one who headed the ball over there to begin with. And now he sneaks in behind on the near side from the throw in to head the ball in It was one of those things where in the heat of the moment, St. Louis more often than not, we'll just lose sight of a guy on the back post from where the ball is. And that's a problem for this team who otherwise is good defending set pieces, is good defending free kicks, and is overall defensively sound when they're able to set up their shape. So I, I think offensively, there's a lot to like, but those moments are what killed them. And you missed, you mentioned um, Jovalich missing a sitter. Edu Leuven missed a sitter as well in, in open play where he just whiffed high on a ball that he otherwise had just an open lane in. All he had to do was just put the ball on net and he had a free goal and he missed it. And so that cost us two points, you could argue. And there are other moments hitting the post a couple times, uh, going just wide where you had an open corner. Just these things that were just a smidge off that I think you want as a St. Louis fan to attribute it to the beginning of the season. You're still working out your form. You're still finding that rhythm of where you need to put the ball, where you need to put your foot on the ball in certain situations. And, and so they're figuring it out, but they still managed to get two goals. One came off a of PK and the other came in the 90 plus third minute showing that no matter what happens. And this is the second time St. Louis has done this too, where they've scored a goal in the dying minutes of a game to come back. The first was to draw rail salt Lake, uh, and then now to draw Austin, where this team also, in, in addition to possessing the ball, something different, they're just not giving up. Last year, they put such an emphasis on scoring first, coming out of the gate super strong. And if they didn't, if they were, they went down earlier, if they went down at any point, it was difficult to come back. But now we're seeing this different facet where they're not trying to do too much with the ball when they go down like this. They're not trying to create something immediate. They're able to not not slow it down and immensely, but even, they're able to be intentional about where they're moving the ball. They're able to pass the ball back and forth. They're able to work space, create space, not just try to force <laughs> their way into it. And when they're doing that late in the game, no matter how many moments they give up, they've been successful at creating something for themselves late. You mentioned uh, the late goal for St. Louis, uh, a very uh, constant thread uh, that we've seen, not threat, I'm sorry, a, a constant thread that we've seen in the first few weeks of MLS. It's a lot of goals scored at the depth. I, I mentioned how um, Portland even, you know, hit a home run, you know, game-winning home run at, at Yankee Stadium against uh, the Pigeons, who look like they're, they're in some, they're in some hot water, uh, you know, very early in the season for them. But uh, yeah, a lot of late goals. Uh, in fact, uh, for us, I was joking with the guys on the chat. Uh, we have like our own little chat, and I was joking out, "Hey, uh, uh, this is before Galaxy came back to tie, right?" And I said, "Hey, uh, watch, you know, Galaxy's gonna come back, tie the game. Tyler Boyd's gonna sub in and score a goal at the death and celebrate in front of our bench." <laughs> it, it, you know, I mean, it could have happened. It didn't, but I wouldn't be shocked. Uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of late a late game drama in MLS right now, which makes for fantastic TV. But if you're the team that's conceding that goal, oh, <laughs> you can only shake your head. Um, so, 
Uh, we can only hope for like a very exciting match this weekend. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be there. I'm, I'm going to be at a wedding in San Diego. Uh, one of my wife's friends is getting married, and she was asked my wife to be a bridesmaid. So eh, I'll be on daddy duty the entire weekend. <laughs> so, well, that'll fun. be interesting. <laughs> How fun! <laughs> yeah, I think it's the first time we, we take uh, we take uh, little Ezra, my son, to a wedding. So it'll be interesting to see how he reacts to the whole situation. But uh, going back to to our our thing, um, one of the things that worries me uh, about the Galaxy squad, uh, regardless of time differences and all that, is just how they had such a hard time against Nashville's V uh, B squad. Pretty much, um, I don't know if it was because the guys that were getting an opportunity to start in that match were doing their best to you know to let their manager know, like, hey, you know, we're not. We're not chopped liver here. You know, we're pretty good too. And we're going to battle for playoffs. I mean, for um, roster spots. So look at us, you know. And they they really pushed Galaxy hard in that game. Um, Brian, where, did you make a, any kind of similar observations? Or do you think it was just Galaxy just having some road issues on their first road trip? It's like major road trip. It's something that has happened last season where it did make me a little upset that the LA Galaxy would play down the competition. And so when they don't see the starters, they think, oh, it's going to be an easy day. Uh, we could take the day off. We could let our foot off the gas. And lo and behold, you know, uh, we ended up going down too early. And the team had a rally to try to come back and, and salvage a point. Uh, granted, we could have won that game. And so, spoiler alert, if St. Louis wants to win, just give us a bunch of penalties because we're not going to score any of them. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's I'm happy that this weekend's match is going to be against an opponent who is right there with us on the table and who seems that are not having that uh, that sophomore slump uh, after having such a successful first year. And so we're going to get to see a, a LA Galaxy that's going to come out of the gates in full throttle, uh, especially because you want to, like you mentioned earlier, Edgar, this is where, you know, you could kind of like change the tide and see jockey for position to, to establish yourself in a great playoff position. Um, hopefully it goes that way. Uh, I still have my my doubts, but it's going to be a really good, good match this weekend. I believe so. By the way, uh, we want to say thank you very much once again, Matt, Big Bird Baker, for sending us Johnny Nelson. Because <laughs> uh, Johnny Nelson, uh, he's, he's quietly becoming – uh, somebody at Galaxy Fancy as a reliable person off the bench. And um, you know that a defender is doing a good job, whether he's a center back or a wing back. If he's not mentioned much, you know, or, or you know, if you don't hear much about him. And when you do hear about him, it's because he's part of, a, you know, of, of an offensive uh, attack or something, you know, where like, he helped create something that led to a goal. But so far, Johnny Nelson is quietly just – Done his job. Uh, Brian, what, what, what were you saying about him earlier? Right? Oh, what was I saying about him? Oh, that yeah, he's more sorry. Th- oh, <laughs> <laughs> he was more than a serviceable left back. And thank you for giving us such a solid backup. Uh, I, I could easily see him start over Alde if, if he picks up a knock. Uh, there's no question that I won't feel safe with a Johnny Nelson on that left back. He just plays simple, professional football. And... <laughs> His mistakes are minimal. Uh, these past games that we got to see him a little bit, um, he's been nothing but solid. Uh, that's what you want from a MLS player of that caliber who, quote unquote, um, is your backup. So I like and that. I'm sure it really helps a lot that the guy up the field on his side of the pitch is uh, Joseph Paintsill. Joseph, uh, yeah. You, you, <laughs> yeah. You, you, you mentioned to me, Matt, that uh, when, uh, when he came over, you mentioned something how – uh, how important it is for him to be able to connect with, with a winger and not and not have to worry too much about you know his role on the team. Can you reiterate some of that so that some people that didn't get a chance to hear that the first time can you know can get an idea of what Johnny Nelson brings? Yeah, Johnny Nelson was our starting left back for a good period of a successful run that we had to start 2023. And he was finding a lot of success when he was able to connect 
with Klaus up top, who would more often than not skew left, or when he was connecting with Jared Stroud on the left side as he attacking mid. Uh, he did. I, my concerns with Johnny Nelson were mostly on the defensive end when he was given one v one tasks in space. But from an offensive perspective, he did a more than serviceable job for us at the beginning of the season, and he did create a lot of chances. He had more than more than a few potential assists where that was one of those MLS didn't credit him for it. But he did find his connections. And when he was connecting with players in the attacking end, not necessarily being uh, that overlapping runner where he's like a wing back pushing all the way to the end line, but he'll push into that uh, attacking third zone well into the attacking half. And if he can feel comfortable in his ability to distribute the ball to somebody out there on the left side, then he he's comfortable. He finds a lot of success, but he's it's when he's asked to do too much, I think, and tries to go above and beyond himself offensively that he gets in trouble on the other side of the ball. Okay. Um, what but that said, these... Edgar, I will say, yes, yes. I do hope to see Johnny Nelson in this game because I don't think we <laughs> since the galaxy played city in the preseason. Do you guys remember the double yellow card that Nelson got himself into with AZ Jackson? There no, I didn't. Them. Ooh, that I like that fire though. I hope he starts that. I would love that. <laughs> I, I was I that's that I was watching on my laptop streaming and it, I, that thought is seared into my mind when they went at it and they were I mean they were <laughs> tackling each other. They were getting physical. It was it was rough out there in a preseason match with those two and I want to see more of that. Yeah, exactly. Every time you play like I've played uh soccer my whole life. Anytime I play against one of my friends who I grew up playing with, I always give it a little extra sauce in the tackles that I give. I throw an extra elbow that the ref is not going to look. You know, I'm going to do pull a shirt, pull a shorts, whatever happens, you know, just to make the game more intense and let them know that I'm there. I would love for Johnny Nelson to start this game and uh, give you guys a real time on the offensive side. Yeah, the, yeah since we're on the hockey team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind if John Nelson goes up to him and like, give me a balls of tug. <laughs> Peter patter. <laughs> Get at her, baby. Uh, sorry, I love Letter Kenny, man. It's a beautiful thing. Uh, have you seen that, Matt? Oh yeah. You're, oh yeah. <laughs> Bonnie McFarland. Ah. Oh. <laughs> anyway, um, something else that uh, we we were talking about um, before we hit record is uh, something. Uh, there was a change that was announced uh, for MLS uh, that's gonna take into effect later this year. I think in the summer. I know that uh, Tom Bogert. Uh, who we love so much. Uh, he's our, uh, you know, American version of Fabricio. You know, yep. we love him. You know, <laughs> if he says it, it's happening, right? Yep. <laughs> so um, we got to get him his own catchphrase too. <laughs> Something but, to do with the mustache. The, what was that? Something to do with the mustache. His catchphrase. Something rate. to do with the mustache. Yeah, that glorious mustache, man. Uh, but uh, just reading off his um, his posts on Twitter, he says sources. Um, a key MLS roster rule change is in the works and is expected to be implemented this summer. MLS is to decouple the designated player and U22 initiative rules. All teams get three U22s no matter what and opens room for more investment. Not 100% done, but expected. Um, so how would you explain that in layman's terms to your typical MLS fan that doesn't sit here like us, right, and like, reads all the fine print, but just wants to go and watch a game and all of a sudden they're like, hey, hey, this is different. What's going on? Um, how would you explain it, Matt? I would just start by saying this lets MLS teams spend a lot more money on more players without with fewer restrictions. The, the idea before is that every team got three DPs, but if you use all three DPs on a senior level player, an over 23 age player, then you only get one U22 spot. So basically you can spend unlimited amount on a U20 on one U22. Now they're saying you can spend as much as you want on three 30-year-old DPs, you still get those three U22 spots. Inter Miami is the perfect example. Edgar, you were talking earlier about how <laughs> they're just cleaning house and they're cleaning house tonight <laughs> against Nashville, but they're a team who they're not just spending on U22s, but they're getting your U22s injured and then spending another $8 million to replace the U22. It's insane what they're doing. Now they get a little bit more freedom in using all of their designated player spots. Maybe Neymar finds his way into one of those spots while still able to spend all this $24 plus million on U22s. 
it, it makes it so much more competitive to be an MLS. And I love that because there's the old um, rhetoric of MLS. Oh, it's a retirement league. Nothing mm-hmm. but older players. This, this, and that. And now you're giving teams incentives to go out and go get your U23s. They're going to make your team competitive. It's it's going to make the league so much better. Uh, it just seems like they made another rule for Beckham. Because I don't know if you guys remember the, the <laughs> DP rule. Yeah. Was because of Beckham. And so now they're using the U23, whatever's going to happen because of Beckham. And it's just, it's funny to me, full circle, whatever. Damn you, Beckham. <laughs> but it, I, I love that it's going to make this league so much better. I, I love that. Yeah, and the the implementation of it was the question I had. And so, Edgar, you said it was happening in the summer. We're in, like, an MLS transfer window right now. And so I just don't want to see this change happen, like, in a window. If it happens during, like, a break, and then it's like, all right, it's going to take effect for the summer transfer window, that's fine. Everybody's playing with a level playing field, and, and everybody can go out and get their own extra U22s if they need to. But that's the only other weird thing is just I heard a lot of people saying, how are they doing this mid season? How does this make sense? But it really only matters as far as transfer windows go. Yeah. Well, hope, yeah. maybe they do something where they just uh, implement the role, <laughs> but it doesn't take effect till maybe next season, which would be, I, I, I'm good with that. Either way. Yeah. <laughs> and just give you guys an update. Uh, the, the St. Louis blues just completely smashed the Kings three to uh, one. And look, no. goodness, the LA Kings <laughs> finally solved his Lord, Jordan Biddington. <laughs> they finally sold, you know, sold them. And uh, Adrian Campy gets us a goal to make the score more respectable. The blues win three to one. Damn it. <laughs> Congratulations. Matt. I would tip it. Yeah. Matt, what, who, do you, who do you give your, 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 uh, your, your Matt Baker big bird award to uh, for the blues tonight? I'll just go Alexi Torpchenko for leading it off, getting things going. I don't know how many saves Binner had, but uh, I'm sure it was at least 20. He gets a, the second star. There you go. <laughs> LA Kings, <laughs> nobody. Everybody just go home, please. <laughs> Bunch of bums. I hope this is uh, not an indication that was going to happen this weekend because that would really suck. God, no. Please, no. <laughs> Nathan had 40 saves, by the way. So this is uh, – he, he kicked it off, and Berkey's going to have himself 10 saves, clean sheet. <laughs> Oh, my bold remember, tonight. penalties 10 penalties we're not going to make any of them oh, see Berkey's <laughs> not good at penalties so that's the thing if you Ooh, have there a, it is <laughs> versus Berkey somebody something's got to give here something's got to give you know, it's funny you mentioned Berkey because I always see his name uh, it's it's just I don't know what it is something about Berkey I guess because he's a DP I always hear Galaxy fans mention him on Twitter sphere they're always like uh, blah 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 our goalkeepers are mid blah blah I wish we had somebody like Berkey and I'm like hmm Blah blah blah. You know these score. You know our goalkeepers are blah because of mostly because of Jonathan Bond, right? And now it seems like we have a better situation with McCarthy and in and, and, and goal. He's not. He's not great, but he's better than what we've had for a long time. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are surprised that oh my god he's scrambling for a ball. Look at that! Oh, he made a dive. Oh, this is what your goalkeeper is supposed to do, right? Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's supposed to be able to chirp and talk to his defenders, not just quietly be like, "Okay, guys." Yeah. So, uh, so you, you, we always hear Berkey mentioned, you know, in the, in the Galaxy Twitter sphere, and man, I wish we had a goalkeeper of that caliber. Uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, honestly, he, Berkey's uh, the reason. Berkey's the reason that the St. Louis offense can do what they do and drop back only Tim Parker and Joachim Nelson. I was talking earlier how high level our center backs are, and they're great. But Berkey is a third center back back there. He's he's very willing to come off his line. He's he reads the game very well. He's not just a guy who's good with the ball at his feet or distributing it with his hands, but he he knows when to when to come out and attack uh, uh, to attack an attacker out in space. He knows when to fall back. It's very rare that he gets caught in space. It's very rare he gets chipped. Those I mean, he's just so high level in his just mental acuity of the game. And he's yeah. great for fantasy points. I know that much. <laughs> Cuz I have him on my fantasy team. <laughs> I mean, uh, I play goalkeeper a bit here and there, but mostly I was a, I was a center back. And as a as a former defender, it baffles me how MLS does not really invest in like in defense as much as they do in offense. I mean, I guess you want to put butts in seats, right? You want to have somebody out there who's gonna you know put the ball in the net. But you look at the history of the teams that have won, um, have been successful for a long periods of time, uh, like our LA Galaxy squads. Every single one of those Galaxy teams uh, had fantastic defense. They had great goalkeeping, and those were like the, those was like the spine that made the team go. Because 
uh, took a lot of uh, took a lot of uh, pressure off the mids and the forwards because they knew that they had a dependable defense, dependable goalkeeper back there. And I know, Brad, you're like raising your hand. Like, think about it. We had Gato Hartman. Not 2014, sir. Not 2014. Leonardo was garbage, sir. He no, only stepped no, up in the game was, against New, was, New England, okay. and that's it. <laughs> Galaxy Leonardo was better than Chivas USA Leonardo, though. Okay, well, anything Chivas USA. <laughs> I mean, you're putting out one guy, but overall, look who was in goalkeeper, man. Yeah, Penedo. No, yeah, 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 Penedo. Yeah. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, I, I look, that's why I look at teams like St. Louis and like even Nashville, right? And I'm like, damn, these. They're so good in the back. I mean, these teams are set up for for um, for success. They just got to find somebody that can score consistently, and these teams are going to be constantly at you know at fighting for a playoff spot, fighting for a championship. Um, but anyway, uh, let's let's do something a little a little bit more fun right now. And uh, we were talking earlier about uh, how Galaxy is missing all these penalty kicks um, <laughs> when. Um, when MLS started releasing all their kits, right? It's an exciting time for all of us, right? Because you're like, ah, oh, yeah, new kits, right? And I remember I, the first time I saw the Columbus Crew kit, I was like, oh, dear God, they did it. <laughs> good grief, actually, good grief. <laughs> they actually, uh, you know, went out and put a, a Charlie Brown kit. And uh, when I went and reviewed their kit, I actually felt it was one of the better looking kits in MLS. I know a lot of people are like, what's wrong with you, Edgar? But I just think it's a, it's a nice design. It's simple. And people think of Charlie Brown and, I went into this whole thing about how Charlie Brown is your everyday man, you know, who works hard and despite, you know, the odds constantly being stacked against him, he finds a way to win. And then you look at Columbus and they almost lost their team and they've managed to win two MLS Cups, a Campeones Cup, and they're one of the, the stronger teams in the East right now. So good for them. But uh, I, you would think that it would be them missing penalty kicks and not the LA Galaxy, right? <laughs> because, you know, they have the Charlie Brown kids. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but um, the the attention, the reason I'm talking about this is because I want to mention something that Matt and St. Luligans like really <laughs> blew my mind was how serious you guys took this. But the 2024 uh, Best MLS Kit Tournament, which is something that uh, I'm trying to get more traction as years you know go by. It's just like the second or third year I do it. Uh, but this is the third year uh, that I have. We have a lot more people involved as far as like podcasters, journalists, creatives that I, I tell them, you know, here it is, you know, send it out to your fans, your, you know, whoever your audience is, make sure everybody gets their votes in. Um, and I rank the, the, the kits based on you know, my own, you know, just my own ideas. I have over 150 kits from every corner of the world. And so I feel like I know what, a, what, constitutes a good kit and I, I have an I, I'm an artistic guy I'm a creative guy too so I feel like okay this looks good this doesn't look good and that's why I based my ranks um now we come to St. Louis right and I'm looking at it and I know I know you like the kit Matt but I gave it you know I ranked them uh it was a 21 yeah 21 overall and I was like you know what? that's that's not bad you know it's you're not, you're not, you're not, you're definitely not bottom and you're definitely not, you know, you know, in the middle, but it's a decent kit. And there were so many good ones this season. And I felt like, you know, St. Louis was, theirs was a lot better than the one that they came out with, you know, the, the, the what was it called? The first one, the inaugural kit, the spirit kit, the spirit kit, right? I felt like it was definitely a step up. And I just found out this week that the pattern, the top, uh, the topographical pattern on the kit, it's actually different for yeah. every shirt which is fantastic. It's almost like a thumbprint. Um, yeah, when I went to buy it at the team store, I, I looked to find a fit, so the size, and then I also looked to which design I liked the most. Like the wave pattern is like thicker <laughs> in certain areas. And so like when you're looking at the top near the crest, it looks different. So I had to find my, had to find my wavy pattern that actually I liked the best. <laughs> there you go. Heard on that before. <laughs> That's pretty cool. Um, but yeah, uh, my goodness, I... I'm gonna I'm gonna look up the stats real quick right here because <laughs> when I mentioned to you, <laughs> when I mentioned to you like, hey, uh, you know, we're gonna, we, you know, we're doing this thing and you know, get you know, get the word out to you know all the St. Louis fans. They're like, man, we good love luck. a good poll, right? <laughs> you're like, we, you know, you guys yeah. made St. Louis, you know, the, you know, the greatest flag in the world, right, or something yep. like that. That's exactly right. Yeah, we we found a poll that was ranking flags, city flags across the globe, and we got St. Louis to win that one. So we, we like our polls here in St. Louis. We're, we're active Twitter base. 
So let, let's see. I'm looking it up right now because I was like, dear God. I mean, I've seen some teams that rally around um, their kits, and I was like, oh, that's pretty good. You know, a nice group. You know, like Charlotte last year, I think they were, they were more uh, involved last year, but I think things are going to pick up for them in the next round. But I'm looking at it right now. So I, it was the St. Louis's the Confluence kit, right, which I ranked 20th against uh, the New England Revolution's uh, Boston Tea Party kit, which – We'll get back to that in a sec, right? The Boston Tea Party thing, but it's a nice kit. I felt like you know it's really nice. It's very imaginative. You know, at first I thought I thought they have like a little pinstripe thing going there, which is actually little dots. And then somebody said it's actually supposed to be the bubbles coming from the tea crates that have fallen into the Boston Harbor. And I was like, oh, that's pretty neat. That's cool because some of the some of the dots are actually like you know like uh, like reddish. I was like, that's that's a nice touch. Yeah, that's really cool. And then. And they said Lewis entered the poll. <laughs> and as of right now, with 14 hours left on this poll, there's 595 votes. God damn. And the Confluence kit has 91% of the vote, pretty much. <laughs> so, I mean, cue that Simpsons meme. <laughs> stop, stop. He's already dead. <laughs> I mean, it's damn. Give it up yeah. to the St. Louis yeah. man. <laughs> yeah. Dude. Lewis likes their Twitter poll. We, we show up and we show out. That's for sure. Whether it's appropriate or not, like objectively, I you could argue whatever you want about the bubble Boston Tea Party kit, but <laughs> yeah, we're not going to lose a Twitter poll. <laughs> All right. So uh, before we wrap it up, um, let's talk about the Rebs because <laughs> we all need a good laugh, right? Matt, how would you describe uh, this uh, Boston Tea Party thing that they've got going on at Gillette Stadium? I get the idea where they're, it's a, they've got a supporter at the front of their supporter section and he's holding up this crate, re- like riling up the fans, just like you could picture they did back in the, the 18th century. And he <laughs> launches this crate a good four feet onto the turf and it just... It bounces like styrofoam. So I, I, I'll just say what I said before we started recording that this reminded me of something where the idea is it sounds so good. It sounds so cool. It's like we're going to re reimagine the Boston Tea Party for our supporters. The crate isn't going to be the tea of the British. It's going to be our opponent. It's going to be a fantastic thing. Probably could have used a few more iterations before it got where it needed to be. But then the day comes and they realize, oh, yeah, we're doing this. Who brought the crate? And then nobody has the crate. So they have to go into storage and get this styrofoam little <laughs> 0.5 pound thing, slap an opposing sticker on it and act like it's going to be this massive thing that they can toss down. And it looks no better. And actually, I'll say it looks worse than the toy jackhammer that the Columbus crew had. Aww. Yeah, I was about to say like the, that the crew is like, you know, and then i uh, here comes this, this drunken guy from Boston. Hey, hold my beer. <laughs> it just, yeah, it was it was so comical. It, even Taylor Twelman chimed in saying, "Could you guys at least you know toss it into like a, a kiddie pool or or something?" Uh, it's not a bad idea though. It's not I mean, a bad it, idea. It's it's, it's, I, a, it's, it's okay. I can see where it could be good. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I bet you some intern came up with this. Like, hey guys, I have an idea. You know, like. Let's try this, and they're like, "All right, all right, all right." right. It's so, like policy. you said, you know. Finally, you know, they're getting ready to, you know, towards the you know, season open, and they're like, "Oh man, we got to think of something." You know, like Nashville has, you know, their guitar riff. You know, the Timbers have the lumberjack. You know, can we dig up something? You know, it's like, well, there's this. You know, the intern mentioned it's like, "Oh, great, great, great!" Send them out to the Dollar Tree right now, right? <laughs> but they could have, they, could they have done like the WWE and like at least doctored, you know, the crate or whatever it was so that when it hit the ground, it was just shattered or something. That would have been great. Right. Like yeah. they, they, they make work out of tables that just explode. So why yeah. can't you get something that looks like it's an actual wooden crate and it'll just like explode on contact and clean it up and you'd be done with it. <laughs> yeah, your shot I, uh, <laughs> yeah. You go around uh, MLS Twitter sphere and you're going to see a lot of people just poking fun at it. Uh, I know that definitely Atlanta United did. <laughs> they were like, take your tea back or something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, 
I wonder if it's gonna be one of those things where it's so stupid, it's so dumb that you know it's gonna stick around as just like a, a an inside joke or just a joke in general. But that it would be like a niche thing though, because in MLS you look at it and you're like, okay, it's just funny, it's just silly, and we accept it as something really dumb and silly. Because we you know we like silly things, right? They make us laugh. But if some outsider comes along, like uh, somebody who's used to the NFL or you know the NBA or even the NHL, and they're like, "What the hell is this?" You know, you know, we you know if we're good with tossing an octopus on the ice, you know, or rats, you know, if you're in Florida, but what the hell is this? <laughs> Great. I'm just trying I mean, to imagine uh, somebody in that stadium on the other side of the stadium, and all of a sudden they hear this <laughs> cheering from the supporter section. They look over, and they see this little tiny crate go and just like boink 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 <laughs> on the ground, and they're just like, "What?" <laughs> is that what just happened yeah i, I mean I, I new england already has a tradition they have the people the, the, with the muskets and i thought that was pretty cool you know when they score a goal maybe they feel they're not scoring enough goals or something so they, we don't hear enough muskets being fired <laughs> but um i wonder i really wonder if this tr tradition <laughs> is gonna survive you know even halfway through the season or if they're just gonna be like yeah let's cut our losses and <laughs> stick with the musketeers or whatever they're called <laughs> but um yeah before, uh, before this, we leave uh yeah. before we leave um we haven't done predictions yet well, yeah no we're, we're gonna get to that oh ah, okay get to that. <laughs> okay yeah I, I was just gonna i was just gonna transition to asking uh matt do you guys have anything like similar to that where you, you know you guys oh. like you know you know grab like some you know a, a six pack of uh, anheuser bush or something and toss it into the missouri or something we we talked about a lot of random off the wall things like a toasted ravioli launcher that we'd have <laughs> what, the hell? what is, what is that? that i don't know it's a i mean it's a like a, a t-shirt cannon that you just shoot toasted raviolis out of <laughs> what about shooting like barbecue up into the crowd oh my barbecue god <laughs> what barbecue sauce shooter i don't know hell yeah that'd be awesome imagine like you're, you're up in the 300 section or whatever that you know the, the, the highest section is at, at city park and you're really hungry, right? And you're like, damn, I didn't get to partake in the tailgate. And then, you know, you know all of a sudden you, you, you look down and it's halftime and they're like, don't worry, we got you. And some guy lines up, you know, some ribs and just fires them up to you. And you're like, oh, yeah, baby. <laughs> <laughs> we right? definitely don't have anything like that. We don't have any food related uh, traditions. Uh, we, we haven't yet succumbed to forcing a tradition in yet thank god because <laughs> that allows us to laugh at the people like the crew or the revs who are doing this the closest thing we have is just bringing back famous st louisans to wave a flag which is harmless in and of itself they don't air it on tv which i'm okay with but you know <laughs> I, i'm okay just letting that thing uh, we'll let other teams make fun of themselves and did, did you guys have taylor Tillman wave a flag yet Twelman has not come on the field to do that yet. I think it would compromise his journalistic integrity. <laughs> he would oh, get his LAFC card it. removed. Uh, LAFC fans, right? No, I'm saying he would get his LAFC card removed. He would not be allowed back in the 3252 after that. <laughs> but um, so yeah, uh, uh, let's uh, let's go to predictions. Uh, Brian, I'll let you go first, man. So they have uh, the percentage of probabilities. Uh, they have the draw at 24%, St. Louis winning at 23%, and the LA Galaxy at a whopping 53%. Hmm. Not sure if I'm going to buy into those numbers. What I saw in St. Louis against Austin was the ability and the calmness of being able to come back being down 2-0, especially with a center man like Lowen, who has... He's really shown that he could really ball in that center mid position. Uh, everything runs through him. I know we have our our specialist and Edwin Cerillo that could try and stop that. Uh, he did try and stop Messi, but to no avail. He still got it going on. I don't know. Uh, I'm scared of the ability of this team being able to come back. And because of that, I'm going to say a draw. 2-2. Two, two. Another oh, and, 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 yeah, and and the the goal expectation is two point five over. So you know, two two seems like a like a fair result for this upcoming weekend. Yeah, I say another draw because both times Galaxy and St. Louis have played, it's been draws. Uh, the last one being last September, where City went up two nothing, and Billy Sharp like went rah, 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 and you know made it two two. 
And uh, Matt, what do you have to say? Yeah, this is the one that gives me concern. This is the one that worries me more than anything we've played so far. And I just, I don't know. I think this is the biggest test, like we said earlier. I, I don't know how effective our, our counterattack style is going to be. I think there's a lot of opportunity with the center backs, like we were talking about, to expose them. I think there's a lot of opportunity to win the the high wing game from St. Louis's perspective. Really hurt you guys deep if your wingers and fullbacks push high. Um, I was going to go 2-2, two, two, but I always hate to be that person who picks the same exact scoreline, so I'll say 1-1 one, one draw. I, think <laughs> I, I, I don't have... On one, on one level, I was thinking this could be a shootout but I never feel comfortable picking an away team to score three plus goals. So I'll instead go the opposite way and say, this is just going to be a high level battle. Neither team's really going to give much and it'll end up one, one. Well, we'll say this though. We're going to get to see a good match. Uh, this match is going to be probably the match of the weekend. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, Not I'm tired of seeing Miami on that apple, man. Damn. <laughs> yeah. Same. <laughs> Damn you, Beckham. Get out of here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there was nothing like that marquee matchup between, yeah, was it New England and TFC this weekend? Ooh. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I Golasso. Really there was a Golasso in that game, though. So, okay. Yeah. I think we have the only late game, if I remember right. So, all eyes are going to be on us on Saturday night. Yeah. yeah. It should be the, 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 the game of the baby. week. 7 30, 9 30 p.m. Central Standard Time. Ugh. Um, But there has to, something has to give. Something has to give, and you've been a gracious uh, guest on our show today. Very sorry, usual. sorry, Matt. Sorry, Mr. Big Bird Baker, but I'm going to have to go with 2-1 Galaxy. Uh, something has to give. I think uh, we're going to see uh, Pinto score one, and just because he wants to impress his blushing bride, Gabriel Peck comes off the bench and scores a goal to seal it for the Galaxy. And then Johnny Nelson gets into a, a, tuss, a tussle after the game. He gets red carded, suspended for five games. I mean, beautiful. <laughs> I mean, maybe he'll get the Gordie Howe hot trick. You know, he'll, you know, maybe, you never know. Maybe he'll be the one who scores a goal, right? Uh, he'll get, a, you know, he'll score on a set piece. And because uh, he says, you know, St. Louis has, uh, you know, has gotten distracted, you know, on set pieces. Maybe he'll score on a set piece. Maybe he'll get into a fight. Maybe, you know, he'll get an assist. And then Johnny Nelson, you know, Gordie Howe hat trick hero since we're on the hockey team, baby. Johnny Nelson revenge game incoming. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> I like that. All right. Uh, well, uh, thank you so much once again, Matt. We had a really fun time tonight uh, talking about, you know, all things LA Kings and St. Louis Blues. <laughs> <laughs> you know, unfortunately, the, the Blues <laughs> took the victory tonight. Hopefully, the LA Galaxy can put up a better fight. Hey, it rhymes. <laughs> hey. And um, as always, uh, thank you so much. Uh, Matt, we look forward to, uh, you know, another meeting with you later this season. Um, before we go, Brian, anything else you want to add? No, not, um, just, um, I guess, go Galaxy. <laughs> <laughs> Keep on nagging. Keep it, I don't know. <laughs> Where can uh, they find you, Matt? Where can people find you? Yeah, where can people find you, Matt? Yeah, me personally at Matt Baker STL, and then uh, my podcast that covers St. Louis City, Flyover Footy at Flyover Footy. Or if you want anything St. Louis insight, follow us on uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, all that stuff. And Perfect. tell people about you know your your blue centric pod, you know, a bit, you know Big Bird Baker Blues or something like that, right? Flyover Hockey, yeah. Right. <laughs> Flyover <laughs> that brand and extend it. We're gonna make that nickname a thing, man. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna see people showing up to games with t-shirts that say big bird baker on it and it's gonna have that little flyover footy logo on it nobody's gonna know what's happening <laughs> <laughs> well you uh, brian where can people find you man you guys can find me as bryant nags on instagram and x slash twitter and of course news across the galaxy on both uh social medias edgar yeah and you guys can find me on twitter x whatever it's called these days as edgar nags also on instagram um and thanks again, Matt. We had a great time talking, uh, making fun of the Rebs and just having, good, just having a good time, man. And, you know, give your balls a tug and, uh, you know, Bonnie McFarlane and go Kings go. And as always, keep on kinging, right? Wait, no, wait. As keep always, on nagging. Keep on <laughs> nagging. Yeah. <laughs> the nag kingdom. There we go. <laughs> All right. And